This is John for Global Traveler. Today I'm talking travel with softball Olympian Taylor McCullough. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm great. I always love talking softball and travel. So this is you're you're perfect for this. Oh, how cool is it for you to have you know softball Olympian tagged on to your name? Oh my gosh, it is a uh, unbelievable feeling. I think that right after even going through the process of training for the Olympics, being a part of the Olympics, um, it kind of feels surreal. It doesn't feel like it's actually happening. So um, now being a couple of years post Olympic run, um, I think that it's slowly starting to set in. I think that it, it's like, wow, I actually have been there. I've actually done that. Um, I've lived it, been able to live out a childhood dream of mine, um, being able to play softball, being able to be in the Olympics. So it's definitely a, a surreal feeling still, but it's, it's starting to settle in. Like I was able to accomplish something huge, um, in my career that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to do. And I'm just super grateful for the experience. No, it's amazing. It's amazing. Just following the, the, your career through that. So let's take you back. When, when did you start playing softball? When did you kind of realize that you were you know pretty good at softball? Yeah, I started playing softball. I think about age seven is when I started. My parents kind of threw me into a bunch of different sports and um, softball was one of them just to see what I was able to do. And um, I really liked playing sports. So I started around age seven. I started pitching around age nine or 10. Um, and I think that, you know, the first couple of years of playing softball, I was just super uh, average, maybe even subpar and just trying okay. to figure out the sport, figure out who I was. Um, and then once I attached to pitching, I think that's when I really started, um, to see the growth and like, okay, maybe I can do this after about a year and a half of pitching started getting a little better, a little stronger. Um, and then just from there slowly started to rise. But I, I think that, you know, every time you, I, I, for me, at least every time I hit like a new, um, age level or, or growth spurt, that's when I really started to see like, okay, um, I can do this. And then I would have the setback of like, okay, now I'm in 14 U. I started travel ball, really super competitive and people are starting to pass me up. Um, so what can I do to get better? And then I, as I got older then it was like, okay, now we're in the recruiting, recruiting age. How can I match that? How can I be better to get recruited, to go to college, um, and play softball at the university level? Um, and so I think I definitely hit those trials and tribulations along the way. But um, I don't know that there was like a distinct time that I could have said like, okay, like I, I'm here, I'm, I've made it here um, until those moments have actually happened to me. So oh, that um, makes sense. It, it, even now it's still always a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of trials and tribulations, you, you have overcome, you know, a, a major one. You, you are legally blind in your left eye. Was that from birth? Uh, yes. So I was born, um, my parents had no idea until after I was born, but I was born with, um, something called Duane syndrome, uh, meaning that I was, um, had a vision disability in my left eye. Um, and we didn't really know all of what that entailed, um, until, uh, we, I started growing, growing up. Um, and even then I don't think that my parents realized at birth what, um, that I wasn't able to see. And so, um, my, like, as I got older, as I started walking, um, around one year, one year old, my parents would notice that like, I, like my stability was a little off that I wasn't really walking straight all the time. There was like, they kind of just started noticing stuff. It's like, huh, like this isn't, this isn't normal. This is our first child, but like, I don't know if this is something normal that should happen in the process. Um, and then that's when they started to learn everything that was going on. They mm -hmm. did all the tests and then, um, at around two years old, three years old, I had my first surgery, um, to try to repair the eye, had another one, got a staph infection in the hospital, which made it worse. Um, actually switched doctors to, at this, at this time we were living in California. So switched doctors, um, went to Dr. Rosenbaum at UCLA and he was great and fantastic. He basically, um, I had two to three more surgeries with him to try to repair the damage that had been done in the first couple of surgeries with the staph infection. Um, and I couldn't really get any sight back, but he just repaired the eye to keep it basically the eye that I have still in my head, <laughs> um, and attached to me. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much where we are. But, um, ever since I was younger, I've just been legally blind in my left eye. And that's kind of why my parents started throwing me into a, a bunch of, um, a bunch of sports, a bunch of hand-eye coordination type things. I played the piano for years. 
Um, so just trying to figure out like, okay, like what can she do? What am I capable of doing? Right. Um, so yeah, I've just, I've been living with Duane syndrome since I was little and basically since birth and, um, that's how I roll. So, <laughs> so I mean, obviously I know you, you have never experienced having eyesight, you know, both, both eyes. So that, you know, you've never experienced the other way, but is there a problem? Did you have to like, what is the adjustment as, especially as a pitcher to the, you know, the depth perception? Yeah. Um, I think depth perception is one, like as I've gotten older, that's something that I've learned, um, is just like understanding depth perception, understanding. Um, I think a big one for me, softball really helps me understand this was, uh, like the peripheral vision. So like on my right eye, like I can see the peripheral vision in my left eye, I can't see anything. And so like, it cuts off really in front of me. And so, um, being a pitcher, um, thankfully I'm left-handed. I was born left-handed. And so that's helped a lot because when I used to be a hitter, when I was younger, um, I was still able to see with the right eye and, um, track the ball in a little bit deeper, which was helpful. Um, but just being a pitcher, I think that's also helped too, or just playing softball in general, being left-handed. Um, but peripheral vision, I think is something that I learned, um, as I had gotten older as well, just like really being able to communicate with the left side or the right side of the field and saying like, Hey, like we really have to communicate. We really have to talk about this. Um, if somebody bunts a ball down the line or somebody slaps a ball, um, to the right side of the field. And it's something that I can get. It's just being aware of who's behind me on the field, learning how to communicate with the second baseman, the first baseman. Um, and, and just really like telling my field, like, Hey, you got me here. Or do I have you? Um, I think that's been the biggest part is just understanding um, the field and understanding who's on the field to be able to communicate about those types of things. Um, but I think it's worked to my advantage because it taught me that like, I really need to be vocal and that I really do need to understand the game on a deeper level outside of just being a pitcher. I need to understand the third base position. I need to understand the second baseman's position and what they're capable, capable of doing and what, what their plans of action are, uh, with a a slapper up versus a power hitter up with runners on bases. So it's just, it's forced me to learn all aspects of the game. And I'm grateful for that because I truly believe that it's helped my softball IQ grow and it's helped me get to where I am now of being a professional athlete and being an Olympian. No, it's an amazing story. I think it was important for you to to tell it because you know, you can overcome people where, it's, you know, I know you know, a lot of people, I've had some issues with my eyesight. And I know people will say the same thing. And it is possible to overcome it. You have to make adjustments, but especially, I mean, it's amazing for you at, at that high level of softball, you know, playing all over the world, playing in the Olympics. And you're, you're, you know, at the top of the field, despite having a, a problem, but you, you've overcome it. That's, that's amazing. I think it's a great story and lesson and inspiration for others out there. Yes. Well, thank you. That's, I mean, that's my goal. I think that when I was younger, I didn't realize that, um, my story could be helpful. And I think for a long time, we just, me and my family just didn't talk about it. We just acted like it didn't exist and that I had normal vision and like, that's the way I was supposed to live. And then, um, my senior year in high school, um, our high school season had started and I had got somebody that, um, a reporter that had came to, uh, like interview a couple of our seniors on the team. And, um, they had asked my, the, my coach and my coach had to call my parents and say like, Hey, um, they want to talk about Taylor's eye eyesight. Is that something that's okay? Um, and my parents were like, Oh, like, I guess we just had never really thought about it. So then they had asked me like, is it okay to talk about it? If you're uncomfortable, just tell them that you don't want to talk about it. And I was like, no, like I just, that's the first time I had ever really gotten asked about it. Um, and outside of recruiting, um, I think that was something that I was always transparent about with, uh, college coaches in the recruiting process. Like, is this going to be an issue for you? Is this going to be an issue for the university? Um, and they thought that we were crazy for asking that question, but we just didn't really know, um, if that was going to kind of like taint the way that like my, um, recruiting process was going to go. And so when we found out that it wasn't, I think we just continued on the the idea that it just wasn't a thing. Um, and then once I started talking about it, once I got into college, I think that's when I realized like the more pe- people had talked about it, the more stories that had come out about, um, my eyesight and, and what I had gone through growing up. I think that's when I realized I could be an inspiration to younger athletes. I could be an inspiration to, um, females with disabilities. I could be an inspiration to anybody with disabilities. Um, uh, and I think that that's the cool process I've met and learned about a lot of kids and a lot of people that have had other disabilities that have 
heard my story and have thought how great it is and um, how it, it has inspired other kids um, in the younger generations to want to pursue sports or want to pursue things that they thought they wouldn't be able to um, all from hearing my story. Um, and I think that it's really cool because I looked up to people like that when I was younger um, that I could potentially relate to or say like, dang, that's really cool. Like I, there's somebody like me up there doing that. I can do it too. So um, it, it, it's, it's, my story, I think it's normal, but I also sometimes forget how um, it can change people's lives and I can be an inspiration to others. And that's really important to me now as I'm older. Well, you're an inspiration to me and I'm a, just an old reporter and a softball hack, but you, you are an inspiration to me as well for that. Well, thank you. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your, your travel. You've been all over the world. You've played, uh, obviously you're playing, you've played for Team Mexico. You're on Team Mexico. You played in the Japan Diamond League. You played in the Olympics. What was when you went to the Olympics? Was that your first time there in, in the, yeah. uh, the country? I mean, uh, in Japan, yes. So going to the Olympics, that was my first time in Japan. Um, our team, Team Mexico, had done a um, kind of like an Olympic circuit uh, training run. Uh, we started it in 2020, and then when COVID happened, everything kind of shut down. The Olympics got postponed a year. Um, so after everything had opened back up again, we continued. Uh, basically started from scratch, just like everybody else had with their like Olympic training. And so we had done, um, some different types of travel, um, out of the country and in the United States playing college teams in those two years. Um, and in 20, in the fall of 2019, um, our team had actually gone to Japan to play there for 10 days and do, um, play exhibition games against the national team. Um, I didn't travel with our team because I was in, um, grad school. And so I had midterms that week it, that they were gone. So I couldn't go. Um, so our team had done a couple, had been to, uh, Japan a couple of times Mexico had. And so, um, that was my first time there was the Olympics. Uh, but we luckily we got out there early. We had played some exhibition games against the national team prior to the Olympics and had played, um, some of the, the professional teams and college teams or universities out in Japan prior to the Olympics starting. So we were there about three weeks early. And so I think that that really helped us because we had got to be there for a little over a month, just training and playing and practicing, um, in a bunch of different locations. Obviously we couldn't do any sightseeing because of COVID or anything right. like that. But, um, I had been there a few weeks early, but that was my first time in Japan. That was my first time being a part of the Olympics. Um, so there was a lot that kind of just gets thrown at you for your first time experience. So I was super naive to Japan <laughs> prior to going to the Olympics. Fortunately, now I can say that I'm not naive to Japan and I've done a lot of sightseeing explorations, um, playing in the uh, Diamond League in Japan in their professional softball league, um, which is such a cool opportunity. And anybody that gets the opportunity, I absolutely think sh should take it. Um, but it's just, it's one of the greatest things that I could say that I've ever done in my life. Um, living in Japan for two years has been awesome, but, um, yeah, that was my first time. So everything was really new, really fresh and, um, overwhelming. <laughs> well, as now as a Japan, uh, uh, veteran, um, could you like, what would be a few, if you had to say like a few of your highlights of places you've been, or, you know, maybe places you've eaten, whatever, like two or three of your highlights from Japan off the field. Yeah. Yeah. Off the field. Oh my gosh. There's, I think there's been so many highlights. I think, um, just getting to meet, uh, be a part of the league and getting to have the experience of, uh, living in, uh, internationally living in another country that you're not familiar with, um, learning the culture, I think has been something that has been super exciting. Um, my favorite place after traveling a bunch of places in Japan, I think my favorite place to travel is Kyoto. Um, I think a lot of people like Tokyo, I was about a 35, 40 minute train ride from Tokyo, like where my location was living. Um, so I would go out to Tokyo and um, the like the subsections of Tokyo all the time, but we didn't get to go to Kyoto too often. I think I've been there twice in two years just because it was so far, but that's definitely my favorite place. You get the city vibe with the, um, the scenic and the nature vibe as well. Like it kind of gives you a little bit of everything that Japan has to offer. And so I think that that was my favorite location. Um, but outside of just traveling, we would travel every weekend. So we would be at a new site, a new place every oh, weekend wow. to play games. So just getting able to walk around, whether it was a smaller area, a bigger city. Um, I, I just truly felt like I got to see all aspects of what Japan had to offer, um, and, and the different cultures in the different areas. Um, but just really learning from my teammates, learning from my translator, 
um, learning about the different places in Japan, what they were famous for. I think that was something that was super exciting. We would travel somewhere and they would be like, oh, this place is famous for um, this type of ramen or this place is favorite for uh, is famous for their matcha or this place is famous for their American burgers. Like it was just super exciting to um, be able to learn about Japan, learn about the areas that we were going to um, or just like where people were from. I think that was really cool. We had a bunch of different players on our team that were from different locations. So they would talk about it all the time. I just think that was the coolest part was just getting to learn and experience the culture while being there to play softball. I think that was really cool because I didn't think that that was something that I would be able to do was like travel and sightsee so much, but I got to do a lot of it. So I think that was my favorite part of it. And what would your travel tip be then for, for somebody, maybe for a, a new player who hasn't been there yet, hasn't played in there and visited as the veteran, a young veteran, obviously, but what would your, uh, what would your travel tip be? Oh my gosh. I think traveling to places that aren't um, as popular, I guess, or like not the touristy places. I think some of the places I said, Kyoto was my favorite. It's really touristy, but I think that some of the the cities that we would go to, they were so small. Um, they were more like outside suburban areas. I think that they ended up being some of my favorite places. So going to places that you n- maybe would not normally hear about when you're traveling there. I think that that that's where you really get the culture. That's where you really get the true experience of what it's like to live in Japan um, or, or get the everyday lifestyle of somebody living in more of a secluded area. Um, because I think that like the bigger cities get so crazy. You kind of um, forget like, oh, this is really cool. People live this life and people do live in the big cities. They do live that lifestyle, but it's also nice to take a step back and and look at Japan um, and look at the nature and look at everything around it. Um, the scenery, the um, their lifestyles. I think it, it's pretty cool. I think that's the coolest part. So just being able to separate the bigger cities from the smaller ones to get the full experience. Um, but I, I know there's a bunch of other people out there who have been out there for years more than me, or even people that have moved to Japan and have all their travel vlogs and say like, this is what you need to do. This is where you need to go. Um, so I, I did spend a lot of time looking at that and like looking at places that would be cool to go. Um, but also I think some of like the best days I've had are just not having a plan, just getting on a train and picking a location and stopping there and spending the day there and saying like, wow, this has been an exciting day. This is something I never even imagined myself being able to do just not having a plan and getting on a train and going somewhere and ending up walking around and, and seeing everything that Japan has to offer. Great advice. Yeah. I really, really appreciate your time. And there, there are so many things I want to talk to you about, but before I let you go, got to talk to you about your clinics, your coaching. Tell us all about that. Yeah. So I've just been, uh, I'm finally back in Arizona. Um, I've been located here for in Tucson for about 10 years now, um, since I went to the university of Arizona, but, um, now just coming back, just doing, um, I've done camps and clinics in the past. Um, I've done personal, like individual instruction, uh, group instruction as well. Um, obviously like I'm super passionate about softball. I really want to give back to the game. Um, Tucson has played a huge part in my journey of softball and my career. So, um, I love giving back to the Tucson community. I love the people out here. Um, and I just want softball to grow. I think that the only way for, um, softball to continue growing is for the people that are currently a part of it to give back and continue to grow the game. So while I'm in Tucson, that's what I do. I do a bunch of camps and clinics and, um, lessons while I'm out here with some girls and, um, I just, I love what I do. And, um, if I didn't love it, I wouldn't be doing it anymore. So, um, just, I have some things coming up, trying to get in the works of planning camps and clinics for the near future and for the rest of, um, this coming up softball season. And then, uh, once athletes unlimited starts up again, I'll be out there in June and July and, um, just playing in the summer. And then from there, we'll see what happens. But right now, this is my time to just kind of breathe and relax and live life and, uh, give back to the game that's given so much to me. So, um, it's going to be interesting. I'm a go, go, go type of person. So now that I'm more relaxed and have free time, it's, it's going to be an interesting six months for me, but I'm excited for what the future has to hold. So, well, we could tell on your passion is it's, it's contagious. And you know, you know, I'll be out there when AU uh, comes back to Rosemont. Awesome. Know? Um, tell everybody where they can find out more information about you and your camps. Um, yeah, so I have a website. It's called uh, Tay B L L C. So T A Y B E E 
Um, and so if you just look up tabysoftball.com, um, that's usually where I post all of the camp and clinic information. Um, because I'm in the Arizona, like the Phoenix, Tucson area, I, but I post a bunch of the stuff, like the flyers and information when, um, we're in, like, we start to do the registration for camps and stuff on, uh, the, like the Facebook group sites. So it's easy for people to find. Um, I send out emails to all the people that I have before, but, um, usually that's where everything's up and running. So people can find out more information if they're interested, but I try to get some, some other famous softballers from the Tucson area or uh, po uh, post Arizona, Arizona state alumni to come out and help do camps and clinics with me, or even uh, post Olympians and uh, other international athletes to come out. So it's not just me. You get to meet a whole new group of people, a whole new vibe, um, get to learn from new people. So uh, it's pretty exciting. I try to keep them exciting and entertaining. So people want to come back, but that's kind of where you can find out the information um, or people can just, you know, do the, the old fashioned, uh, send a DM direct message, whatever via social media. And that's how I can give them info as well. Sounds great. Taylor, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story about, you know, everything. I mean, it, there's, you have so much going for you and you're such an inspiration. I wish you a lot of luck in the future. I'm gonna, you know, I'll be following you. You know, you'll see me in Rosemont. Um, so, you know, enjoy the holiday season, enjoy re relaxing, even though you're running a bunch of camps and stuff. Enjoy it all. You deserve it. Thank you so much. It was great uh, talking to you and it was a pleasure uh, taking the time, but thank you so much. Have a wonderful holiday season and hopefully I'll see you really soon in Rosemont. You too. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Have a nice day.